All right, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. It's about five after six, and if anybody else wants to jump on and um, get in on this webinar, they're more than welcome to do so as well. So thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, I know it is a uh, Thursday evening, but I appreciate um, you tuning in. And so we're going to do um, a little workshop tonight on life books. So um, many of you know that my background, uh, my name is Tiana. I am the adoption counselor, um, one of the adoption counselors here in the Green Bay office. And I am also the casework supervisor. So I am in charge of managing um, all of the staff in all four of our locations um, and kind of keeping up with them on what's going on with their cases. I do a lot of assigning of cases as well. So I um, also, my background, I was in child welfare in Chicago for over 12 years. And a huge part of what my job entailed um, was helping children and families create life books. So when we had the opportunity to do a workshop on life books here as part of our um, Touched by Adoption campaign, um, I definitely and happily raised my hand to do so. So um, just want to kind of do a little housekeeping um, tonight. Feel free to, although everybody can see me, I can't see everybody else. So if you have any questions or anything comes up along the way, um, please feel free to chime in in the chat box. If you know me or have ever interacted with me before, you know that I'm going to ask a lot of questions and kind of um, solicit some uh, feedback from the audience. So please go ahead and um, uh, participate in that way if you feel comfortable. I will be happy to send out the PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to be taking a look at tonight as well. Um, there's some links on there that might be helpful. And um, if you don't catch it when we're, um, you know, when we're going through, that's perfectly fine as well. So um, without further ado, I think we're going to go ahead and get started on our life books. Um, presentation. When we're done tonight, please go ahead and check out our website. We have our big Touched by Adoption um, event coming up next Friday, the 13th of November in the evening. Um, it's going to be a virtual event this year, so please feel free to check out our website. We have a lot of really great silent auction items on there, up for bids, including um, a signed jersey by Jordy Nelson, um, some phone calls with Santa, some massages, pampering packages, uh, hotel stays, um, a fancy Starbucks basket that I hear is a hot commodity right now. So please feel free to check that out and bid on some of those items if there's something in there that looks interesting. So, all right, looks like we have a chat. We have a question. Oh, here's a link to the auction site. There you go. So Angie Flannery is our director. She's kind of helping with the tech part of things tonight. Um, and she's posted the link to our website up in the chat box. So if anybody wants to take a look at that, you are more than welcome to do so. So, all right, so um, we're gonna talk about life books tonight. Um, this is certainly not the end all be all training on life books, but this is a neat opportunity to have a little introduction into what a life book is, um, what things go into a life book and how you go up creating one. So this is something that we have a lot of passion about and option choice. And while a lot of the training and a lot of the life book um, conversations typically will revolve around children that are in the foster care system and may enter into an adoptive placement later in their life, it's still an important tool to use um, with your adopted child, even um, if you're adopting them as an infant. So Kind of some, uh, let's see, make sure that I can do this correctly. All right, so what is a life book, okay? So has anybody ever done a life book, had any experience with life book, know anybody that has a life book, checked out a website that has something to do with a life book, anything? Anybody do anything life book related? All right, cool. Okay, so <clears throat> a life book is a visual record of a child's life. So it's not a scrapbook, right? It's not necessarily something that um, you'll share with everybody in your life. It does not just um, indicate positive things in children's lives. It's really the story of their life. So even when we're when you're thinking about adopting an infant, it's important to know and important to remember that their life did not start the day that they came to live with you, right? They grew in someone else's womb. They, um, you know, had experiences in utero that are different than the experiences you're going to give them in your family. Um, and so having a life book, even to 
um, to tell the story of how they came to be with you and to give some to enlighten their story and enlighten their history, culture, um, and part of and how they became part of your family from their birth family is important even for an infant. So um, a life book is an opportunity to talk about how you were matched with their birth parents. So how did that match process look? Were you matched early in the pregnancy? What kind of things were you uh, were important to you when you were talking um, with your spouse or your partner about adopting? What did you hope for? What were you looking for? Um, how did you envision your family, right? And then once you were matched with your child's birth parents, um, what did that look like? Take some pictures at those match meetings if you can, um, you know, and start to document your child's life even before they were born. It is, uh, life book is an incredibly critical part of helping any child in care. And I know, like I said, we started, you know, talking a little bit about children that come into care into the foster care system, and that may not be your experience with your child, but um, we kind of use that term generally um, coming into care, meaning, you know, leaving their birth family and coming to live with you as their adoptive family. So it's, it's important to, you know, to be able to honor their child, your child's past. Um, and as, as a life book is a tool to kind of help you um, navigate some of that and to let your child know that you respect their culture, you respect their background and you respect their history, right? So some of that may not be, um, roses and butterflies, but it's an uh, it's a wage. It's how they became um, into this world, and it's a good opportunity to to be able to honor that and respect that. It shows that you care about their need to know about their life, right? So kids are constantly going to be um, in reunion. We talked about that um, sometimes in our um, in our adoptive family training, and that. Children, adopted children want to know about their birth family. They want to know about their life before they came to you, even as babies, right? So they want to know about their extended family. They wanna know about siblings and they wanna know about um, their birth parents. Um, it's also critical for a child to know that they can count on you to help them answer their questions and that they can count on you to help them feel safe. So a life book is an opportunity, it's a tool um, to start answering some of those questions about why was I adopted? Why did my parents choose adoption? How did I come to your home? What was going on in my um, birth family that made it, you know, un made me unable to stay with them? And then um, counting on you to help them feel safe so that they feel safe um, and empowered to be able to answer those questions and to be able to talk about their family of origin and that you are a safe space to be able to talk about that. Any questions so far? Anything kind of um, anything on anybody's mind or any fears that you might have about starting to create a, re uh, a life book? All right, cool. Awesome. All right. So a life book also helps to tell their story in a way that they can understand. So a big part of the life book um, has to do with illustrations and pictures. Um, and so there are different points, obviously, in children's lives, different, um, you know, different developmental levels, different chronological ages that you may want to go back and revisit your life book. Um, and they may be able to um, interpret and understand information at different points, right? So this can bring, um, the life book can bring difficult fears and feelings to the surface. So fears or feelings about their um, birth family, about their siblings, about their extended family, about their family of origin. Um, this is, is a, again, it's a tool, it's an opportunity to talk about some of those things um, and maybe some of the fears or some of the anxieties that the children might be having about their birth families. It provides info, um, right? And it's tangible. It's something to hold and look at. So it's literally a book that you can take out um, and it can you know, be an opportunity to start some of those conversations. There are plenty of families that I've talked to um, and have had experiences with through the years that kind of um, make it like an annual, you know, an annual event. They kind of pull out the life book and go through it. And um, you know, as the children get older, there um, is likely opportunities for them to give input and information as to what goes into the life book um, and things may change. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit.
um, again, you can go back and look at it at different points um, and different developmental levels in the child's life. So when they're little, you can, you know, you're obviously your conversation with them and your um, experience with them is going to be different um, than it is when you're looking at that with a teenager. Um, we also talk a lot about how do we explain birth families and reasons for placement or reasons for adoption? Um, and a life book is a good way to start that conversation as well. So, you know, when they're little, it may look at look something like, you know, well, your your mom and dad were, you know, they were not in a place to be able to, you know, take care of you. So they chose us to, you know, to be your parents and to raise you, right? And to to be your family. Um, when they're older or when they're teenagers, you know, there might be an opportunity to have a little more specific discussion about exactly what was going on with the birth parents at the time that they were unable to care for that child. Um, and it can also, the life book can also help explain some of your, some current issues that may be going on. Um, an example could be like, you know, well, you, you know, you know that you have ADHD and um, that, you know, the, the cause of your ADHD could be, you know, a symptom of your birth mom's drug use in utero, right? So that could be an opportunity to kind of talk about maybe where your ADHD came from or if there's other um, challenges that the child is facing, then those are opportunities to maybe talk about some of those things and link some of that information as well. So any questions so far? Everybody doing okay? Excellent. All right. A life book also tells your child's story in a way that they can understand, right? Oh, we already talked about this. Just kidding. So it helps to validate feelings and it can also improve their self-esteem. So it enables the child to find meaning and heal from their story. Um, you know, we talk a lot about birth parents and we talk a lot about if things, you know, were going really well for birth parents and they had a lot of resources and, you know, they were feeling very supported that it's likely they would choose to parent, right? So most of our families that end up choosing adoption for their child have some challenges along the way. And so um, it enables the child to be able to understand maybe some of the reasons why their birth parents made the choices that they made and to be able to understand their fault, right? Um, and to be able to heal from that. I just found a typo and I apologize for that. I will fix it before I send this out. But children sometimes feel that adoption or removal from their parents was their fault, right? And this is an opportunity to have that conversation that no, honey, it was not your fault at all. You had nothing, you know, you had no reason. There was no reason that you were removed from your home or that your parents chose adoption um, based on your specific situation or your circumstance. And so it's an opportunity, again, to talk about the child's story, to talk about their past, in developmentally appropriate levels so that they can, um, you know, learn a little bit more about that. So any suggestions on approaching abuse and neglect? Absolutely, I have tons of suggestions on that. Um, and obviously those conversations are going to be different at different levels um, of, you know, the child's development. So I actually watched um, a little clip today while I was kind of refreshing for tonight's um, presentation and there was a foster mom on there that you know had that exact same situation that the child came to them and you know said something to the effect of like why you know why was my mom unable to keep me or why you know did she choose not to keep me and um you know it it's really starts out very simple as something like you know well your mommy um you know she wasn't ready to be a parent or she you know she couldn't take very good care of you because she you know she was uh, whatever the situation was, she was, um, you know, struggling with um, taking care of you and your brothers and sisters, or she was, you know, not ready to be a mom yet, or she was still in school or something like that. So when that little guy came to that foster mom and said, you know, what, what happened? Why did I have to leave my mom's house? Um, she just kept it very simple for him and said, you know, your mom wasn't ready to be a parent. And so um, she asked your dad and me to do, you know, to take care of you and to be your mom and dad. And for him, that was okay, right? At that point in time, because he was little and, and a simple answer was sometimes a little easier and, and for him to understand then, you know, your mom was neglectful or your mom, you know, made some choices as a parent that weren't very good for you. Um, your mom wasn't able to keep you safe. That's another good one to use. Um, and so she asked mommy and daddy or mommy and mommy or daddy and daddy to, um, you know, to take care of you and to be your parents and to keep you safe. Obviously those conversations can change as children get older um, and they get to be a little bit more able to, um, 
to understand some of the dynamics um, that might have gone on in the reasons why that child was not in their um, family of origin. So does that help at all, Alex? Obviously, we can have more um, specific conversation after that, but all right, cool. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, excellent. All right. Whoops. I may have gotten a little like trigger happy here. Okay. Um, so again, it enables the child to feel, find some meaning um, and it helps them to understand that removal from their parents was not their fault, right? Or the reason that their parents chose adoption was not their fault. Um, and something to remember at the end of the day, um, and we talk about this a lot too, is no matter what the situation is that led the birth parents to choose adoption, every birth parent loves their child and wants the best for them, right? Um, Rachel says she's had similar questions when talking with her inquisitive three-year-old, right? At high of a three-year-old as well. And the questions that come out of that kid's mouth absolutely blow my mind. <laughs> so I'm like, where do you even come up with that? And how did you find the words to ask me those questions? So Rachel, what has been, what has been, if you're comfortable sharing, what has been some of the conversations that you've had with your three-year-old or how have you been able to kind of navigate some of those things? What's been helpful for you? Now that I put you on the spot. <laughs> similar yeah just keep it simple right um we there's a lot there's a good um a good kind of line or a good kind of you know tagline when you're asking kids is when they ask you some of those questions of course it's probably going to be at a time when you know you've got 29 other things going on and you're not even thinking about you know what they're thinking about and being able to answer those questions is something that catches you off guard so a good kind of a good kind of thing to put back on them to buy a little space and a little time is what do you know about that right or what questions do you have about that? Tell me what you know about your birth mom, right? And then that's a good starting point to see where, um, you know, where they're developmentally at and what kind of information they already have or think they have, right? So Rachel says, we focus on how much her birth mom loved her um, and wanted us to be your forever parents, exactly. And for most three-year-olds, that's probably gonna be enough because they're gonna be moved on to wanting to you know, do something else. But as they continue to grow up, they might start asking a few more questions. Um, and as opposed to just you know, going into a huge dialogue about when well, your mom was using you know, drugs and alcohol and she was homeless and you know, she was making some bad choices, um, you kind of put it back on them. What would you like to know? right? What would you like to know about? What do you already know? And then do you have any more questions? So really taking it at their pace and allowing them to um, initiate the conversation and initiate the questions. And you all know your kids, you know what they can handle and what kind of information they can take in and where they're at developmentally. So you know them best and you know what, what will work and what will be helpful for them going forward. So good questions. Thanks. And children are excited to talk about their strengths and interests. There's a big part of the life book process too that helps to identify kids' strengths and interests. Um, again, I was you know, watching a little clip about a young lady, she's a teenager now um, and she's in the foster care system um, and she's, she's in the process of being adopted by um, her current foster parent. And one of the things that they were, they were kind of going through the life book and she had indicated that she's always been interested in playing the guitar. And that was kind of neat to see because she'd never had the opportunity to play the guitar before. And she'd never really expressed that interest to anybody um, other than writing in her life book that this was an interest of hers and something that she wanted to do. So that was an activity that they were able to get going for her. Um, and that, like I said, that came out through the life book and that was a, a really neat opportunity to, you know, to talk about, um, about her strengths. So, all right, excellent. Um, also, Lifeboat can be a really cool way to connect with people that um, children have lost. And again, even in an infant adoption, um, oh, hold on, what if you have a situation where one birth parent wasn't involved in the decision to place the child for adoption? For instance, the birth mother placed the child, for instance, the birth mother decided to place the child for adoption, but the birth father denied paternity and wasn't involved. How do you explain the birth father's story in a life book, especially to a younger child? Excellent, Christy. We are going to come to that in just a minute, okay? And so if I don't answer your question in the next couple of slides, let me know and we'll bring it back up. Does that sound like a plan? Awesome. All right, cool. 
All right, so a life book is also a cool opportunity to help a child reconnect with people that they have lost. So even in an infant adoption, um, there is loss, right? So there is a loss of that biological family. There could be um, a lot of times there are siblings involved that um, may stay with the birth parents, or sometimes there might be multiple siblings um, that are in different placements that may have been adopted, maybe in foster care, maybe with relatives or other family members. And so the life book is an opportunity to document the people in the family um, and to you know, possibly identify some resources going forward, especially we're talking about older kids too. Um, you know, when we're looking for placement resources or we're looking for people for that child to connect with, there could be extended family or siblings or other people involved in that child's life as, as smaller kids um, that might be able to play a bigger role in their life now. Um, Understanding and kind of knowing their, their roots is also an opportunity to help children feel a part of something bigger, right? So they're part of your family and they're part of your extended family, but they also have the cool opportunity of having a birth family and an extended family through that. So it allows them to feel part of, you know, two families, um, which may end up being um, a really positive thing for them as they continue to grow up. Um, documenting the birth family, it shows your, uh, your willingness as the adoptive family to allow your child to love both families. So by your taking the time and energy to put into a life book and to document some of their extended family and their siblings, um, you are showing them that you care about their extended family, you care about their past, um, and that you are giving them license or giving them the opportunity to, to love both families and to care about both families, right? It could be a current link between current and past family members. Again, an opportunity to talk about the birth family in a way that doesn't feel unnatural or that the child might feel uncomfortable bringing it up. Because if you're looking through the life book, you're talking about the child's story um, and it's a natural way to talk about birth families, right? And when they, just something to keep in mind too, and this is kind of a, um, you know, this goes along with adoption in general, is when they have questions, it doesn't mean that they love you any less. They're trying to find some balance in their life. So, um, you know, it could be just something as simple as, where did I get my brown hair from? Um, or, you know, why do I wear glasses? It could be something, you know, more significant, like, you know, my mother and my grandmother mother were both alcoholics. Does this mean I'm going to be an alcoholic, right? So they're kind of searching for that meaning and searching for that balance in their life. And having the, the life book, again, is another tool to be able to answer some of those questions. Sometimes um, we have a lot of missing pieces from the life book and from the families. So a lot of times we don't, may not have a lot of information on extended family, or we may not have a lot of information um, about, you know, where other siblings are, especially if you don't have a very, you know, open relationship with the birth parents, or certainly what happens a lot of times too, is we don't know who the birth father is, or there might be, um, you know, several men that are possibilities for the birth father. Um, and those questions are definitely difficult to answer because we don't know the answer either, right? I don't know who your birth father is. And sometimes I think it's okay to just say that. We don't know who your birth father is, right? And that's one of the reasons. And because your, your birth mother and your birth father, father were not you know, in a relationship or we're not in a position to take care of you, again, you know, that's why they chose, you know, daddy and me or whatever to be your parents or to be your forever family. Um, and if there's any opportunity, you know, that's, that's on us as adoption workers too, to, to do a really good job to try to track those people down and to get as much information as we can and to give it to the adoptive family. But sometimes we just don't have that. And it's important to just be honest and just say we don't have that, right? Because as we know, kids start to, um, you know, create a fantasy world or a kind of a fantasy life um, of what things were like before. So if they don't have some of those answers, even if we don't know the answer to some of those answers, um, then they start to create this, you know, kind of fantasy world and suddenly their, you know, birth parents become Beyonce and Jay-Z, which we like, no, probably isn't the case, right? But um, so again, being able to answer those questions, 
um, and encouraging those questions um, about their birth families, even though it may make us feel a little uncomfortable, it probably, it likely does not mean that they love you any less. Um, they're just looking for that balance. So, and then encouraging letters and messages from the birth family and extended family for some closure. So if you, you know, you don't anticipate having a relationship with the birth family or the, their extended family, is there something that the family can provide to be part of the life book? Can they write a letter? Can they, you know, send a message? Can they provide something, you know, um, one time I had a, a grandmother that, um, sent a recipe that she had made of a dish that she had made for the family when you know the little girl was living with them and so that was really special because she had a little recipe card that the grandmother wrote you know those little whatever those little three by five cards with the grandmother's handwriting on it and the grandmother had passed away shortly after that little girl had entered into foster care and so that was really a kind of a cool um, memory for her and it's definitely going to take some work um, on your part because you know, I don't know any family that just has, you know, letters and messages and recipe cards coming flowing in from their birth family and extended family, um, especially when we have folks that are incarcerated. And so that's something we're going to talk about in a little bit too, um, is, you know, incorporating some of that um, documenting, you know, documentation from the family, from the birth family to be able to include in your child's life book. And it doesn't have to just be a one-time thing. I had a, um, a family a few years ago that the um, adoptive, fam the, the adoptive family had a, um, a relationship with the birth family and the birth family would send um, emails. They had opened or they had created a, a separate email account so that the, it was just dedicated to the child and um, the birth family. And so the birth parents would write emails and the birth grandparents would write emails and the adoptive family kept all of those emails and printed them out over the years and added them to her life book so that, again, these are not, you know, emails that need to be, you know, widely spread across all everybody that you know, but that was really meaningful to that family to be able to have those emails over the years, even though they weren't all you know, all really long drawn out, I love you and I want the best for you. Might They might just be a couple of lines like, you know, we're celebrating, um, you know, we're celebrating Christmas here with, um, you know, your brothers and, and sisters. And, you know, we just want you to know that we love you and that we think about you. So that's kind of a neat way for the child to know that they, um, you know, that they were loved and that they're part of, um, you know, part of their birth family's thoughts. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about this so far? Awesome. All right. Okay. So again, it's an it's a tool for some open and honest discussion, right? It's an opportunity to start talking about the choices that their birth parents made, um, maybe some information about their conception, and where is the birth family now? There are plenty of situations that we have um, that unfortunately lead to adoption because of a sexual assault or a rape that the birth mother did not consent to the sexual contact that led to the child's conception. How do you have that conversation with your child, right? And especially at, you know, age five. So again, it's using developmentally appropriate language that could, you know, be something as simple as, will your daddy hurt your mommy? Um, or your daddy, you know, touched your mommy in a way that she didn't, um, that she didn't agree with, or, you know, however you want to phrase it based on your child's level of, you know, understanding, um, it's an opportunity to start having that conversation, okay? And where is the birth family now? So um, some of my most amazing adoptive parents have kind of followed the birth parents throughout the years and have, you know, printed pictures off of Facebook. Um, some of you have probably heard my story about um, the little girl that came into care um, and she was in foster care for a couple of years and she had absolutely no pictures of her birth mom. And she was like nine. She couldn't even remember what her mom looked like. Um, and so, and I knew that her mom was incarcerated in prison. Um, and that was part of the reason why her parental rights were terminated and she was unable to, um, 
to parents. But um, so I actually went on the Illinois Department of Corrections website and printed out a picture of her mother um, in black and white, just on you know a piece of copy paper, and she's wearing a you know the traditional. Department of Corrections jumpsuit and her hair is a hot mess and she's scowling at the camera. Um, but that's the picture that we printed out and put into this little girl's life book. And she just treasured that picture. I mean, that was the only picture that she had of her mother was this, you know, inmate picture, um, which wasn't even a good picture, but that was her connection. And that was her connection to her birth mother. And that was really helpful to her um, as she moved forward and was adopted into a new family as well. So again, life books are not always, you know, roses and butterflies. It's not a, it's not a scrapbook and it's not a, you know, it's not a, these are all of the highlights of our life. Um, and, you know, there's some tough stuff in there too. So we also want to remember that when children are not given the, the pieces of their lives, they lose a piece of who they are. So if, you know, it's fairly common sense that if we don't have good building blocks for identity, um, sometimes those identities get lost, right? Or we create a false identity. Again, that whole, like my parents are Beyonce and Jay-Z, right? They're probably not. So, um, and it's a good starting point and opens the door for some difficult conversations. So most kids that um, end up in an adoptive situation, like we've talked about many times, um, come from tough, tough spots. And so it's hard to have those conversations. It's hard as adults to have those conversations. So, um, you know, again, having a tool, having something tangible is a good starting point into, you know, kind of talking about how they came to be and why they don't why they're not with their birth parents. All right, any questions so far? How are we doing, Rachel? Any, any, any of that kind of hit, hit home for you? All right, cool. Christy, how are we doing? Birth father's story in a life book, especially to a younger child. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, and Christy, in your situation, um, is the birth father known? Or is any of his family known, like um, his mother or his grandmother, anybody like that? Maybe we'll come back. Birth father is known. Okay, awesome. All right, but he's, I'm, I'm assuming not involved or not not um, interested in his children. Yeah, see, so your little one has some half siblings out there, Ho hopefully, right? Um, and so how do you have those conversations with your child, right? How do we, you know, birth father denied paternity. Um, I don't know that that's something that you have to have, you know, that's a conversation that you have to have right away with your little one, but it might be at some point when they get a little bit older. So one of the things too that um, we kind of talk about, well, we'll come back to this. All right, we'll come back to it. All right, so what goes into a life book, okay? So this is a lot of people are like, well, what do we put in the life book? Um, and so here are some ideas. This is not definitely a, you know, end all be all, but this is a, a neat opportunity to, to kind of get a little bit of information about what goes into the life book. I'm going to put myself over here. All right. So some pictures of birth parents, siblings, and extended family. Enlist the birth parents to help you with this. So this is kind of a neat opportunity to create that relationship with your birth parent too. A lot of families come to us and they're really uncomfortable about creating a relationship with a birth parent or, you know, what do I say to them? How do I, you know, interact with them? We don't have a whole lot in common. This is a great way to, you know, to bridge the gap and to start having some of those conversations. So I'm creating a life book book for, you know, my daughter, um, would you be willing to give me some pictures of your family or, you know, grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, things like that, um, so that we can, you know, add that to our child's life book and tell them who these people are. Um, pictures of the hospital that the child was born at. Sometimes, you know, you're not there at the time that the child was born. Um, but if you are, take some pictures. Take a picture of the doctor, the nurses, the caseworkers. Woo, that's us, right? Take some pictures of us. Throw, throw us in your life book. Um, if you have the opportunity to, you know, go back to where your child was born, take some pictures of the community, you know, take some pictures of the downtown area or take some pictures of the hospital or, you know, things like that. Um, those kind of, you know, sometimes those um, little 
there's those little like books or booklets or pamphlets or, you know, cards, whatever they are that say in the year you were born, this is what was going on, right? So a loaf of bread was, you know, $1.89 and a gallon of gas was two thirty six, dollars And, you know, I don't want to talk about who the president was, but anyway, um, you know, whatever was going on, you know, in your child's life, throw that in your life book too, because that's pretty cool um, and a neat opportunity for them to kind of connect what was going on in the world or going on in their community at the time they were born. So um, take some pictures of your child with their birth parents, um, if you have the opportunity to, especially if, you know, if you get the opportunity to meet with the birth family um, after the birth or at the hospital, um, if there are extended family members there, have, take some pictures with the, you know, before the child is discharged from the hospital, or if you have the opportunity to meet with them um, throughout the years, take some pictures um, with the child and their birth parents and their siblings. Um, help your child and create a biological family tree, right? So I'm no artist. I guarantee you my, all of my little family trees look like, you know, broccoli stalks, but, um, you know, that's a, a neat opportunity too, to kind of figure out um, where everybody fits. If you can, put a copy of their original birth certificate in there, right? Um, especially if you change their name. So sometimes that's really neat for kids to be able to see that, you know, they were born one name um, and that, you know, now they're a different name, but this is their original birth certificate. It has their, you know, birth parents' names on it, where they were born, things like that. So that's kind of a neat, you know, a neat thing to put in there too. Um, if you have the opportunity to take pictures of the adoptive family, and the birth family together. So this is, a, again, a really neat way for a child to feel included and loved and accepted um, and like their story is something to be honored. If you do end up um, you know, with an older child, if you have the opportunity to get any pictures of their previous placements, um, previous foster families, previous caregivers, their homes, their school, um, those types of things, um, again, letters from the birth family, especially incarcerated parents. Incarcerated parents love to write letters. They don't have a whole lot else to do in prison. Um, so if you have a relationship or you can create a, a safe relationship with an incarcerated birth parent, encourage them to send your child a letter. Encourage them to send your child a card, you know, for their birthday or for Christmas or, you know, whatever they can do. Um, and put that in their life book because that's a really neat way of showing that they were still thought about and they were still cared about and they were still loved, um, even though they were separated from their, their birth parents. Um, again, this is a neat opportunity too to include things like school reports, you know, little drawings, report cards, notes from teachers. This is especially helpful for older children as well, um, especially when they move around a lot in the child welfare system, they don't have that stuff. And so, you know, doing some work as their adoptive family and going back and getting some of that stuff um, or, you know, creating situations where you can, you know, drive past their old school or where you can, you know, print off something from their, you know, website, you know, school website or something like that. Drawing an adoptive family tree, so showing them how they fit into their adoptive family. Um, adding their adoption decree. That's going to be a huge day for you guys, right? Your final adoption, um, finalization of adoption, and that, that document that comes from the court that says this is your child, and this is their name, and this is their parents. Um, and then a copy of their new birth certificate. So what their new name is going to be, um, what the, you know, that could, that could be different than their birth name, um, but it's definitely going to be different because it's going to have your name as their adoptive family. So those are kind of some ideas of what goes into a life book. Uh, should you include a dark story about biological family in the book? Um, I, I'm definitely going to say don't embellish. Don't embellish the story. So if, if it's a tough situation as to why the child came into your home, um, again, you're, you're going to kind of have to you know, gauge where your child is at developmentally and emotionally to be able to receive that information. Um, but yeah, you're going to have to be honest about what, you know, what this situation is that led the child to be in your home in the first place. And that will develop over time, I'm assuming, um, that the, the story will get a little more detailed as they get a little bit older. Um, but yeah, that's a tough one to be able to, to talk about why the, the child came to your care. Um, 
And again, over the years, you know, things may change in your life book and you may add a little bit more information as the child gets a little bit older. Um, but I would start from a place of honesty and I would not embellish the story into some kind of a fantasy that didn't really occur. Does that make sense? Ish? All right, cool. Awesome. Okay. All right. Oops. Okay, so how do I create a life book, right? Um, it does not matter what tool you use. It doesn't matter if you use a notebook. It doesn't matter if you buy a fancy scrapbook off of Etsy. Um, the important stuff, the important information is how much time and effort you put into it um, and how much information you're able to put in. So life books never end. They're an ongoing process, right? Um, how many times, you know, myself, I'll use myself as an example, you know, I'm older than a teenager, I'll just say, um, and I've gone back and looked at my mom's, you know, baby book of me from the, you know, late 70s, early 80s, um, numerous times, and I just think it's so cool to see, like, the little lock of hair and to, you know, hear about, you know, when my mom went into labor and, you know, stuff like that, so, um, so understanding that the life book is something, you know, that may, change over time. Um, it may include different information, but it is an ongoing process. And, you know, it's, it's a constant opportunity to be able to talk about your child's story, because as we know, adoption is a lifelong process and identity is a lifelong process. And so this kind of all goes hand in hand. Um, a life book is all about maintaining connections. So however you want to create those connections, um, whatever, however you want to write that down or draw that or you know, paint it or, you know, whatever your creative, um, you know, meme is there to, to go with that. Um, sometimes it's helpful to create a timeline. So even in an infant adoption, literally, you know, taking a chunk of paper and, and putting a timeline on there and type, you know, writing out, um, you know, we, we got the call from, a, you know, adoption choice that um, your birth mom had picked, you know, November 15th, 2020, we got the phone call from Adoption Choice that um, your birth parents had picked us and wanted to meet us, right? And so, you know, October 20th, 2020, or November 20th, 2020, you know, our first match meeting with your birth parents, you know, October 22nd, or sorry, I'm going October, November 22nd, 2020, we got the phone call that, you know, they loved us and your birth parents chose us to, to adopt, you know, um, you know, November 25th, 2020, our first phone call with your birth parents. We were really nervous and really, um, you know, anxious about it, but we talked about um, how much we love you and what color we're going to paint your nursery, you know, something like that. And then, you know, December 15th, you were born and kind of what that happened. So literally, you know, taking a chunk of paper and, you know, making some tick marks and creating a timeline is a neat opportunity to, you um, to be able to show children, you know, kind of how they came to be. So what if I don't have any photos, right? Or what if I don't have any information about the other parent? What if I don't know who the birth father is? What if, um, what if there's multiple birth fathers? What if I know who the birth father is, but he refuses to participate in any of this? Um, again, you know, checking out social media, I referenced the Department of Corrections website because unfortunately, you know, a lot of our birth parents do encounter the criminal justice system, Google, right? Or last, you know, um, last F ditch effort is having the child draw a picture of what they think the birth parents look like, or, you know, based on what they look like, um, you know, what, what do you think your mom looks like? What do you think your dad looks like? What do you think they look like now? Um, what do you think they looked like when you were a baby? Um, so there's definitely different ways to kind of get around that if you don't have any photos or you don't have any, um, you know, any way to get a hold of any of that. What do you think your grandparents look like? You know, what do you think your brothers look like? Things like that. So um, this is definitely a, you know, an opportunity to involve the child in the life book and also to, you know, draw a little bit on their creativity as well. All right, so I have um, just some kind of 
um, some I ideas of life books here that we um, have you that I've utilized before. Um, so literally, if you go online and go to Google or go to Amazon or go to Etsy or you know any of those websites and just type in life books, you'll get a lot of information and you'll get get a lot of different types of life books. Um, and again, it doesn't matter what you which life book you choose. It doesn't matter. What it looks like doesn't matter if you stick it in a you know three ring binder or you know whatever it is but the, the idea is to be able to capture the information to be honest about the information and to allow the information to be shared with the child at, at times in their life so the first four here up on the top are um, like this first one is my family my journey um, and that's a neat one. It's pretty popular. I've seen it at a lot of places. Um, and that's actually a baby, <clears throat> a baby book specific for adoptive families. So um, it's pretty gender neutral. It doesn't say anything about like mom or dad. So if it, you know if you've got a same sex couple or you've got a you know a single parent, um, it's pretty nice for that. It's pretty like I said, it's pretty neutral, um, and it's specifically for adoptive families that are adopting um, that are starting with babies. So. Um, it talks about, you know, the hospital, it talks about the match, it talks about, you know, what we were thinking and feeling before you came, things like that. So, um, and then it, it can grow and there's additional pages that I think, I think you can um, purchase additional pages as well um, to add in there as the child grows up. These next three, all about me, all about marvelous me and a self-discovery journal are for like elementary into adolescent age kids. Um, and these are opportunities for the child to have much more input into the journal, journaling, um, writing and drawing than um, that, that first one, which is probably this one, which is probably more for just um, the adults to work on. But these three are definitely a collaborative effort to be done with your child. And then these other ones here on the bottom, I used to work um, in Illinois, I used to work in Chicago and I worked for an organization called Lutheran Social Services of Illinois. And that was a really great agency that did a lot of, put a lot of work and a lot of effort um, and received a big grant into the, their life book program. And so they actually created a life book, which is here, down here in the bottom left corner. Um, I think it's called like my awesome, something with awesome in the word. Um, and those life books were given to all kids in foster care. And th that was a really neat opportunity um, for the caseworkers and the adoptive families to be able to work on those life books with the kids too. So you can order that one as well. Um, I'll show you a couple of links here in a, in a minute or two. Um, and then these other ones, these other three on the bottom here are just um, life books that were created by you know, individuals and are on the internet and able, you're able to order them. So again, don't feel, you know, don't worry if you're not the creative artsy scrapbooky type. Um, that part definitely isn't as important as, you know, making sure that the information is there. And a lot of these life books um, will give you prompts. So it's not like you have to start, you know, from scratch handwriting, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs about your child's story. Um, some of these um, life books have, you know, some kind of pre-worded information in them to be able to kind of prompt you. So um, I also put up some links here as well. Um, what I realized I did not do was like tell you who sponsored these links. Um, so there are some life books in here um, from the, uh, there are some information in here about life books from the um, child welfare side of things. And there's also the first one is a link that talks about life books, do's and don'ts, which is actually a really kind of a neat guide as well to be able to talk, um, to be able to help you decide what to put in there and what not to put in there. So um, like I said, if you're interested in um, receiving a copy of this um, presentation tonight, you can certainly um, email that out to anybody that's interested. Just let me or Angie or somebody know and we'll be happy to do that. All right, cool. Alex says, please. Absolutely, Alex. I will hook you up. Absolutely. So, all right. That being said, um, just a reminder that November is National Adoption Awareness Month, right? So kind of an opportunity to celebrate adoption. Um, our, again, our Touched by Adoption 
um, event is next Friday. It is free. Please check it out and um, bid on some of our items. We have several other activities coming up. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Tiana. You are most welcome. Um, we have several other activities coming up this week and next week. This Sunday is another, or this Friday is our um, Adoptive Family Mixer, virtual mixer with Lindsay and Lakeisha. They're gonna be doing a cool um, trivia program. And then next week we have an Adoptive Family Support Group. Um, we have a discussion about transracial adoption on, um, I think it's Tuesday night. So that's gonna be with an adult adoptee who was adopted transracially, some information on transracial adoption straight from somebody who was a transracial or who is a transracial adoptee. Um, and then we have um, some other events coming up too. So thank you so much for coming and um, being with us tonight. I just wanted to um, thank you all for what you're doing as well, being an adoptive parent and, and going through this adoption process is not easy for anybody, um, but we definitely appreciate you and, and um, thank you so much. So without, well, we got another chat. Thanks Tiana, we love all the events. Oh, she called me my teacher. Oh, yes. <laughs> So cool. I love it. That's amazing. So, all right. Well, yeah, reach out to us if you need any help with any of this. Any of our um, counselors are more than helpful um, to be able to, you know, help guide you in the right direction. Um, and just understand that, you know, this is a process. You don't have to have all the answers at the beginning, but um, thank you so much for coming tonight. If you need anything else, let us know. All right. Take care.